Welcome to a new year, everyone. It's 2014, a time for new beginnings, new ideas, and if you're lucky, new ways to fail. Let's talk about failure today. Let's talk about trying stuff out, tinkering, poking stuff with a stick and seeing what happens. Look around you, everyone here is accomplished. We're good at what we do, we're admired by our students and their parents. Our failures are behind us, right? Well, that's the problem. There's a wonderful old saying, if you're green, you grow. If you're ripe, you rot. If you're resting on your laurels and not pushing yourself to try new things and be willing to fail, you're not learning. You've all heard stories about people whose failures eventually led to their successes. There's a pretty famous Nike commercial with Michael Jordan in which he delineates how many game-winning shots he blew, how many games he lost. I have failed over and over and over again in my life, he says, and that is why I succeed. In 1993, Apple came out with a new device called the Newton. Does anyone remember it? It was a handheld PDA with a nice little stylus and voice recognition software. When it was launched, the first one that they showed on stage at the launch, its batteries were dead, so they had to get out another one. The voice recognition software was so bad it was a national joke. It was an epic fail. So what did the folks at Apple do? They didn't give up on the personal device market, did they? They learned from the failures of the Newton and eventually came out with fairly successful devices like the iPhone and the iPad. If you're not failing, you're not learning. Doing what you already know how to do is fun, but it doesn't help you improve. Consistent success does not help you learn and grow. How many kids do we have here at CA whose response to failure or even less than perfection is to break down, to fall apart? That's because they haven't developed resilience, a sense that not everything they attempt will or even should be a vibrant success, and that they're going to need to bounce back from setbacks. Why does this happen in our classrooms? One reason is because, in most school activities, structure is valued over serendipity. That's a quote from the excellent book Invent to Learn by Sylvia Martinez and Gary Stager. It's hard for us to get out of our boxes and let surprises happen, good or bad. If those surprises lead to failure, that needs to be okay. Students and teachers need to develop that resilience to say five things. One, failure is inevitable in everyone's life. Two, there isn't always one correct answer. Three, it's okay to say that didn't work. Four, you take more chances when you're not afraid to fail. And five, failure leads to different paths, and many times those new paths are better. Martinez and Stager go so far as to say, it's not really failure that we're talking about here, but working toward continuous improvement. Really, it's about this. Keep moving forward. How can we get our students to embrace failure as a natural part of the learning process if they don't see us fail sometimes? We also have to be willing to take those risks and deal with the consequences, the times when things do not work out as we'd hoped. We cannot be afraid to try something new, even if it means trying it over and over again. And we have to be willing to share those failure stories with others. Fail fairs have been organized by people mainly in the mobile communications technology field to share failure stories. Their purpose is to advance the field. At fail fairs, people take an honest look at projects that didn't work and talk openly about the projects in order to help others learn. Can you imagine bringing fail fair to our professional development? Teachers sitting around talking about classroom activities and projects that didn't work? You have to set the right tone, non-judgmental. Make it about learning, not blaming. You also have to be sure to get people in the room who want to learn and want to understand where things went wrong and what could be done differently next time. So what happens when we create an atmosphere at our school where it's not a straight line to the right answer, where solving problems becomes an iterative process? That is, a process of coming up with new approaches to a problem, then reworking and reworking, changing things here, shrugging your shoulders and saying, okay, let's give it a try, of adapting to what's been learned and changing directions as needed and repeating that cycle. What happens then? Well, what happens is that students become makers. They become innovators. Call it experimental play, call it tinkering, call it design thinking. Innovators give things a try. When they tinker around, they figure out what, how something works by poking at it for a while. Don't we want our students to take risks, to experiment, to play with their own ideas? If we let them do that, and if we're willing to do that ourselves, we'll all start to see ourselves as learners with good ideas that we can make into reality. Noted author and educational consultant Rick Wormley suggests that teachers set up real situations in which we truly don't know the answer or how to solve the problem and then find that answer or solve that problem constructively in front of the students so they see what it looks like to struggle and then to handle it wisely. But if we want to bring innovation to our school, we have to be willing to accept that the process is messy. Tinkering is messy. For centuries, knowledge was fairly fixed. It was agreed upon and organized and put on a page in a book. 
But that's not how things are anymore. Knowledge today and what learning looks like today, these things have changed. It's not just on the page. It's global. It's not ordered. It's messy. You used to want your administrator to come into your class when students were quiet and orderly and working alone. Now you want them to visit when the students are active and engaged and messy and loud. That's what learning looks like now. So take those risks. Take them for yourself. On the website admittingfailure.com, it says something very wise. Fear, embarrassment, and intolerance of failure drives our learning underground and hinders innovation. No more. Failure is strength. The most effective and innovative organizations are those that are willing to speak openly about their failures because the only truly bad failure is one that's repeated. I want to leave you today with this. I want to tell you about the IKEA effect. This is not nonsense. This is an actual phenomenon. The IKEA effect is a phrase coined by some very prominent researchers who found the following to be true. You're all familiar with IKEA, right? You buy your piece of furniture in a box, and then you take the box home and you assemble the furniture. And sometimes it's incredibly frustrating and difficult, but after some hair pulling and some setting aside of what are clearly extra and unnecessary screws, you have built your shelving unit or your desk or whatever. Well, what these researchers found was that people who make things value their own creation, even a flawed creation, more than the same things created perfectly by others. In fact, they found that people would actually be willing to pay more to buy their own creations rather than pay a lesser amount for the expertly made piece. Because the things we make are the things we love. They're the things we're proud of. And that's what you need to remember for yourself and for your students. If it's yours, if it's theirs, if they've gone through the frustrations of trying and experimenting and failing and trying again and learning and making it better, they'll be able to say, this is entirely mine. I made it. I love it. And it was worth every misstep along the way. Thank you.